Lots of sorts to talk about it in the very first episode of Inside Lands in the month of October. Hendrick and RCR are teaming up. IndyCar releases their quite odd 2021 schedule. Bill Elliott is coming out of retirement. If the people out there that enjoy the 750 horsepower package, well, you're in luck. 2021 is going to offer much more of that. Yo, what is up everyone? My name is Jack Cross and welcome back to the episode of Inside Lines. Like I said, to the very first episode in the month of October. Before I get into, the, into today's episode, I just want to point this out. Uh, the growth on this channel in recent months has been incredible. I was not expecting this at all. Um, I did focus a lot more on quality instead of just trying to get the video out uh, you know, first compared to everyone else. I focused more on trying to make the video as good as possible. And uh, apparently you guys seem to enjoy it, so thank you so much for all the support you've been giving me on the channel in recent months. To the long time, to the loyal subscribers, I've been there since the beginning basically, to the new ones. I mean, we are, what, I think 200 away from 4,000 subscribers. It's just crazy. So, just want to point that out at the beginning of the video. Thank you so much. Now, to the people that haven't subscribed already, if you guys want more weekly content on all forms of motorsports, Click the subscribe button and make sure you leave a like on the video. And of course, so uh, hit the bell to get all notifications so you do not miss any videos from me in the future. All right, enough of the BS plug. Let's just jump straight into it. Our first story revolves around Hendrick Motorsports and Richard Childress Racing. Now, it's been no surprise that Chevrolet has been struggling. I've always said that 2015 was when we started to see a passing of the torch. Since 2000, well actually, I wanna say since the 80s and 90s, Chevrolet has been on top. But in 2015, when Joe Gibbs came out with their new 2015 Toyota Camry, when we saw Kyle Busch win the championship, we saw Toyota step up their game. Then Infinite Road came into play. And now we're starting to see a passing of the torch with also Ford getting a brand new addition in Stuart House Racing in 2018, getting a lot more help from Team Penske, them improving their performance. And we started to see a shift in Toyota and Ford growing and Chevy dropping. 2016 was the last time we saw Chevrolet in the championship four in the NASCAR Cup Series. And apparently Chevrolet has decided, you know what, we need to do a major change. And that's where they're going to get. Hendrick Motorsports and Richard Childress Racing have both announced in a joint statement that they will make the same engine. In terms of before, Hendrick would make their engines, RCR would make their engines. Now, they're going to all join into one. Now, this is big because if you look at Chevrolet, again, there is two people, or at least two uh, companies that make the engines, Hendrick and RCR. When we take a look at Ford and Toyota, Ford, they only get from one supplier, and that is Yates Racing, or Doug Yates Engines. Toyota gets it from TRD. Chevrolet, they let their own teams do their business. Now, uh, probably, people are probably, probably wondering, why isn't Ganassi in any of this? Well, to be fair, Ganassi hasn't had an engine shop in years. They originally used ECR engines, and then up until, I think, a few years ago, they get their engines from Hendrick Motorsports. So it really does. they don't really need Ganassi involved in this because Ganassi already uses Hendrick's engines. Now, this is, again, this is a very big deal. Um, Chevrolet, like I said, has been struggling for years now, and they needed to make a major change for the 2021 season and also get ready for the 2022 season. I mean, why not? This, is, I think, is the perfect time to try and experiment something to get settled in together with working with other people to come up with a new engine that can work with the 2022 car that can help Chevy get back on top. And I know this is a big deal because there's a lot of people that hate, hate Toyota, um, including myself, and would like to see Chevrolet back on top. So this is gonna be very, very big. Now this does affect in terms of jobs, a lot more jobs are gonna get cut off because when you bring two companies together, usually you don't, requ you don't require as many people because you already got other people from another company joining in. So that's the only downside from this, but regardless, this is the change that Chevrolet needed to make. They needed to do something very drastic. Uh, having them come out with a new Camaro Z01 it worked at first. I mean, you saw the first six races of the 2020 season or so before COVID-19 happened. Chevrolet was on top. You had Hendrick drivers, Alex Bowman, Chase Elliott already won races. Well, Chase Elliott won a race later on uh, around Charlotte a few weeks after NASCAR returned from COVID-19. But Chevrolet was rolling. And then as you got later, later on to the season, we started to see Toyota and Ford back on top and Chevy in the background. So they needed to make a real change real quick. 
and I'm very glad that they did this. Now the opener to the round of 12, it had a fantastic finish. Unfortunately, not many people saw it, at least compared to last year. This year's Las Vegas race had a ton of competition with the NBA playoffs taking place. I believe it was with the uh, Heat and the Boston Celtics. I think it was game seven on Sunday. And then you had Sunday night football take place all at the exact same time. So obviously, Ratings plummeted. Last Sunday's NASCAR Cup Series playoff race averaged an only 1.15 rating and 1.97 million viewers on NBCSN, marking the lowest rating and viewership in the young history of the race that debuted back in 2018. Ratings fell 19% and viewership 17% from last year and 10% and 8% respectively from 2018. Now again, it was a great race, fantastic finish, uh, but I mean, we just had so much competition all at once. It's no surprise. You did have Steve O'Donnell try to uh, defend the ratings by uh, saying if you look at last year's race around the same time, because remember, that last that Las Vegas weekend last year was Dover. And he tried to say, he tried to make an argument on how, well, look, we did much better in race for the playoffs of last year. Well, a lot of people approach the race differently compared to Bristol and Las Vegas. Dover is not that entertaining of a racetrack as in terms of recent years. So obviously a lot less people tune into the Dover race. Whereas Las Vegas, on the other hand, it has pr produced some pretty good racing, especially during the daytime. And this race uh, was no exception to a good race. This was a very fun event. So obviously more eyeballs are going to be tuned into this race compared to the Dover race last year. Uh, it was a very bad attempt at trying to... I guess you could say make up for the ratings downslide. Uh, again, don't get me wrong, it's still pretty good. I mean, the fact that you're up against Sunday Night Football and the NBA playoffs, um, and I believe also the NBA playoffs was on net national television and, and uh, on ABC, so that didn't help. But yeah, still a great race. Unfortunately, not many people got to see it. And now onto our Inside the Lines Rapid Fire 3 stories to talk about here today. The first one revolves around Honda. Now, Honda was speculated as to be one of the top manufacturers to potentially join NASCAR in the future around 2022-2023. Well, apparently in a recent interview, interview from Honda Racing Development or Honda Performance Development President Tad Kloss, he said that stock car racing and the next-gen formula from NASCAR due in 2022 is not in its plans. He said, quote, regarding NASCAR, I think we've got our hands full right now with IndyCar and getting on with DPI for next season, he explained. We'll see how that turns out. My suggestion is that the more North American motorsports are able to take advantage of existing investments across the series, it gives manufacturers a chance to do more than one thing. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has locked down or has closed on a lot of businesses. And now, yesterday, it was announced that FanVision Entertainment has announced that they have seized business operations as a result of economic impacts of COVID-19. Racing Electronics say they can no longer sell or support the Legend device that was carried under license from FanVision Entertainment. Now, for those of you who don't know what FanVision Entertainment is, it was basically a device that allows you to see the race from a second point of view. I believe it took the race broadcast that you see on TV it uh, displayed it on a very little device and you're able to watch the race for let's say if you are a part of the racetrack that you can't see very well you can go ahead and look at that device and be able to see an onboard camera or see the race broadcast and finally 1988 winston cup champion two-time day 2500 champion and NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee Bill Elliott will join the SRX in 2021. He last raced two years ago in the Xfinity Series at Road America and becomes the eighth driver in the 2021 roster. Elliott becomes the third NASCAR driver to join the roster with other fellow drivers like Tony Stewart and Bobby Labonte. So far, the roster has three IndyCar drivers in Tony Kanaan, Paul Tracy, and Helio Castroneves, Formula One driver Mark Webber, and multi-racing driver Willie T. Ribbs. So, my God, they got Bill Elliott to come in this series. I thought he was done. I'm pretty sure Bill, Bill Elliott is the oldest driver so far in the bunch. I think he's like 68 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I was very surprised to see him even mentioned in this. So I thought uh, two years ago when he did that one-off appearance at Road America, I thought, okay, that was a one-and-done deal. He's going to retire after that. But uh, I guess it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're still competitive, you still want to race, you can go ahead and do whatever you want. And now let's talk about the story that broke out yesterday. Now, the NTT IndyCar Series schedule, it was, I guess you could sort of uh, say it was leaked out by Racer Magazine. This coincided with the bombshell news of the NASCAR 2021 schedule. Now, while the 2021 NASCAR Cup Series schedule, it was very diverse. You had more road courses, a dirt race for God's sakes. It was more variations, brand new tracks to the schedule. IndyCar, on the other hand... Um Ugh, let's just say the least. Uh, four ovals, only four, 
are going to be on the 2021 schedule. Let's take a look at the full series schedule for 2021 for the NTT IndyCar series. So we start off, first of all, a big, big gain for IndyCar. St. Petersburg going to be on network television, on the big NBC. That's a very, very big deal. If you take a look at previous years, uh, I believe since NBC, uh, ABC's uh, IndyCar deal ended, the St. Petersburg race was always on uh, NBCSN. So to see it now finally on the big NBC, that's a big, big thing because you want to start off your series with a bang. And no better way to do that than at St. Petersburg, which is a very fun racetrack. It has produced a lot of exciting racing. And to put it on national television would only help the situation. And then the second big, very positive announcement, April 18th, Streets of Long Beach. The, in my opinion, the second most important race on the IndyCar series schedule just behind the Indy 500. That race was always on cable television. It was always on NBCSN. Well, finally, in 2021, it goes on the big NBC, April 18th. Now, St. Petersburg and Long Beach is two of the nine races that are going to be on the NBC, on the big NBC in the 2021 season. The uh, eight races are going to be on NBCSN. And I love this. This is very good for IndyCar. Uh, they need to get as many races on the big NBC as they can. Uh, very, very happy. Applaud the effort worked by NBC Sports, IndyCar, Roger Penske, and his team to be able to get this job done. Uh, because, I mean, think about it. With IndyCar, if you're going to want to approach sponsors and be able to bring new fans, you're going to have to go to a much bigger audience. Obviously, there's much more people that have NBC than NBCSN. And every single race, if I'm not mistaken, that has aired on NBC so far this year has gone up in ratings. So it's a great thing for new teams to approach new sponsors to be like, hey, take a look at this. This is the trend that we're showing. It shows anytime the race is on the big NBC, ratings go up. You can convince new sponsors to maybe join in on future races. Uh, that's great. All that is great uh, for the IndyCar series. However, that's where it all ends. Like I said, only four races, four races that run on oval. A doubleheader at Texas, Gateway, and the Indianapolis 500. Now, if you take a look at the IndyCar series schedule, you see so we start off March 7th, Street to St. Petersburg. One month, one month later, April 11th, Barber Motorsports Park. 35 days from the first race to the next race. I get it. You want to try and stretch the schedule from March to September when you only have a 17 race schedule. I get that. But my God, 35 days without with no racing in the middle. And this is one of two long breaks. July 11th from the streets of Toronto on NBCSN to August 8th. Nashville on NBCSN. That's almost also a month long break. I understand uh, with Toronto to Nashville, obviously you're crossing countries. You might want to get some time off to sort of get ready for uh, a race back in America. I get that, but I, I, don't, I just don't think it's a good, to ha good idea to have this much or this long of a break, especially when you are a series that is trying to gain as many viewership as possible. If you go on break for so long, it could potentially have fans or at least uh, maybe the casual fans that are just getting into the sport lose interest. One other positive that I like from the IndyCar series schedule, on the other hand, is the break between the Indianapolis 500 and the streets of Belle, uh, Belle Isle in Detroit. Usually with the IndyCar series, you go from Indy on May 30th, and then next week, you have the doubleheader at Belle Isle. Uh, I'm very happy that they get a week break, mainly because, first of all, with the month of May, I mean, it is just absolute chaos for both teams and drivers, for everyone in IndyCar. I mean, that entire month is just chaos. So I think it's good to give all teams, you know, take for everything that went on the month of May, take a week break, and they can get back rolling on with the remainder of the season at Bell Isle. I think it's very good for both IndyCar drivers, fans, teams, especially the fans, because especially when you go through everything that took place in the month of May, I'm pretty sure a lot of fans will also like to take a bit of a break from IndyCar for about a week before they get back rolling in Belle Isle. So that is all good, but again, only four oval races. And there have been some, I'm very surprised that they didn't, they didn't go to tracks like Kentucky, for example. I mean, Kentucky just lost their NASCAR Cup date. I was shocked that they didn't go after Kentucky for, hey, you might not have NASCAR, but hey, we can be a replacement. But the fact that Richmond, I mean, Richmond didn't even get a chance to shine in the IndyCar series. They were supposed to race this year, but unfortunately due to COVID-19, they had to cancel that race. So I think it was the last time IndyCar race at Richmond was 2009. They finally get back on the schedule this year, get canceled due to COVID, and now they're not even on the 2021 calendar. So they didn't even get a chance to show what Richmond could potentially be for the IndyCar series, which is a disappointment. Uh, but... 
yeah, I'm not a fan of this pa- of this schedule at all. Uh, there are some positives, again, with more races on network television, Streets of Long Beach on NBC. There are some positives, but I think overall this package, or this um, schedule, I should say, is mostly negative. At least compared when we take a look at the NASCAR schedule. I mean, that has a bunch of diversity, a lot of fun race tracks on the schedule, any car series. Not that much. And finally, our last story takes place in the world of NASCAR. Now, with the 2021 schedule cut came out, Steve O'Donnell broke a bit of, a little bit of news regarding the two races that a lot of people had their eyes on in terms of what package will the racers run on. Uh, Darlington and Nashville. Darlington, a lot of people have said that this would be a lot better for the 750 horsepower package. You take a look at the Xfinity race this year, how good that was with the high horsepower, low downforce package. A lot of people want Darlington on that 750 horsepower package. And also Nashville, because remember, a lot of people view Nashville Super Speedway as sort of a stepping stone uh, for NASCAR to get into a brand new market in Nashville and to potentially end up having a cup race at Nashville Fairgrounds. Well, you want to try and convince the people of Nashville to let you know that, hey, NASCAR is entertaining and can produce really good racing. It can be a very fun event. Well, you can't have that with the 550 horsepower package. It only works on certain racetracks. Only works on certain racetracks. And so I not many people thought it would have been a good idea for NASCAR to run a 550 horsepower package at a track like Nashville. And well, they said, you know what? You're right. So Darlington, both Darlington races, races and Nashville will now join the other short tracks and road courses to be part of the 750 horsepower package. Not only that, but NASCAR sort of simplified the rules a little bit for 2021. Before this year, for example, short tracks and road courses, basically tracks under a mile, those were the only tracks that could run the 750 horsepower package. Well now, tracks under a mile and a half can run the 750 horsepower package. So Nashville can run it, Darlington can run it, Phoenix can run it, even though they've run it before. I'm just letting y'all know that now, instead of being maybe a third of the schedule having the 750 horsepower package, now 23 of the 36 races will have the high horsepower, low downforce package, and that is awesome. I think a lot of people have always said that they want high horsepower, low downforce. I know in 2017, 2018, they went a bit too far with having basically almost no spoiler and making the cars nearly impossible to drive. But we've seen races this year, tracks that have had uh, high horsepower, low downforce has produced some really good racing, or at least racing better to the 550 horsepower. So very happy to see this change. And hopefully this could lead into 2022, having NASCAR get rid of that 550 BS and go to the normal high horsepower, low downforce, Big motor, small blade, you know the deal. All fans want this. And uh, hopefully NASCAR follows that in 2022 with the next gen car. But that is going to conclude this episode of Inside the Lines. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe for more content. But until next time, my name is Jack Cross from MDK. And I will see you guys next time.